Okay, I think everybody can see that. Yes, okay, thank you, Olive, and thanks for the possibility to join and to host this lecture today. Hi and hello to everyone, and of course, Magadang, Magadangabipo for Marinelle. It's very late in the evening, I think, in, in the Philippines right now. The lecture series Climate Controvers Controversies is organized by the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Bonn in cooperation with Fridays for Future, the Stiftung ASEAN House and the Philippine Muro. Every week, experts and activists from and on Southeast Asia will analyze the effects of climate change and on the region and discuss the challenges and strategies of climate justice and the climate justice movement. Today, we will record the lecture. I think Oli said it already, um, and we will stream it on Facebook and on YouTube. My name is Miriam Overhoff. I'm the head of the NGO Philippine Bureau. We are a small NGO in Cologne. And the Philippine Bureau is an independent socioeconomic and political information center based in Cologne, Germany. Our mission is to inform and raise awareness on the German public on current socio-political and development issues concerning the Philippines. We are staying in close partnerships with different non-governmental organizations, networks, and aid agencies in the Philippines and elsewhere working on Filipino topics. Um, but we are working also very close with, for example, overseas Filipino workers or Filipi the Filipino diaspora um, here in Germany as well. And we always welcome um, volunteers to our small organization. Um, yes, but mainly um, we are working on the topics human rights, climate justice, labor migration and land rights in, in the Philippines. But for example, migration, we are working also on um, countries where migrants, Filipino migrants are living. Um, and of course, we are regularly pu publishing reports and inside, inside views. Climate justice and the effects of plastic pollution in the Philippines are some of our main topics as well for the situation right now. At least since 2013, when Super Typhoon Yolanda or International Haiyan destroyed the Philippines, we are focusing more on the climate justice topic. The rising of the disaster capitalism in, in reconstruction has a serious consequence for the Filipino population until now. The threat to human rights and climate activists is constantly rising. Yeah, but I think Marinel um, Sumuk Ubaldo from the Philippines will tell us something more about this later. And now, um, yeah, enjoy watching the lecture and I will turn over to Maximilian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mia. Um, I'm going ahead now. And first of all, I'm going to introduce our today's speaker, Marinel Ubaldo. Um, thanks for coming, first of all. Um, and yeah, uh, when she was 16 years old in 2013, she lived uh, at her hometown, 1,000 kilometers southeast from Manila. By that time, the type super typhoon Haiyan hit the Philippines. I guess the most of you heard that or heard about these, uh, this typhoon. Um, the typhoon destroyed the whole region. There were dead bodies everywhere and people lost their homes for months. So everything was destroyed and it was a horrible situation for the whole Philippines. Yeah, Mar Marino, sorry, Marino were forced to grow up and decided to make a change because um, yeah, she realized that climate change wasn't an um, yeah, abstract future threat and it was kind of like real. So yeah, after that, she became a global future activist and starts Fridays for Future on the Philippines. So you could say she's like a Greta Thunberg of the Philippines. And furthermore, I'm going to share my screen, right? Furthermore, um, she's an ecological justice campaign coordinator of Living Lodato Sea Philippines and one of the founders of Youth Leaders Environmental Action Federation. She has spoken of uh, at the opening of the UNFCCC COP21 in Paris and at the Climate Justice Liability Public Hearing in New York, USA in 2018. 
She has recently been trained by former US Vice President Al Gore as a climate reality leader, and she continues to tell the story in the global platform aiming to shed light on the reality of climate change and the urgency for world leaders to keep their climate commitments and for the rest of the world to act on it. So yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy our today's presentation uh, at our climate contro controversy series. And uh, yeah, now I'm going to head over to Marinelle. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's evening here in the Philippines. Uh, it's 11 in the, in the evening. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited for this talk and I really hope to share something very insightful to you guys. Um, allow me to share my screen. So as what have been already said, okay. I am Marina Obaldo. I am um, a social worker and an international climate justice advocate in the Philippines. And uh, I am from a coastal community in a far um, remote community. It is a coastal like in front of the Pacific Ocean. I am a daughter of a fisherman who has lived his whole life providing for his family. Life has never been easy for my father. He wasn't able to finish grade school because he needed to work in order to provide for his whole family. He wasn't able to go to school because of that. And he, he was already fishing at the age of 10 years old. This is my place, Matarino here and this is the Pacific Ocean. So I am living here. I grew up in a very beautiful coastal community where everyone is sharing their food, where everyone is just kind to each other, where everyone, every child could just run to the sea and enjoy the seashells and just um, enjoy the beach. And here comes 2013. So now I will be sharing with you um, the typhoons and the climate injustice in the Philippines. So Philippines is an archipelago, as you may already know. It is composed of 7,641 islands, and it is situated in the um, west, Western Pacific Ocean. It is positioned on the Pacific Ring of Fire, and it is close to the equator. That is why we are prone to typhoons. And let me share to you how beautiful our country is. So this is the Philippines. We are very, um, we are very rich with nature. We have very beautiful um, islands and white beach. And this is what um, tourists have been um, going back and back to the Philippines too. And we have beautiful sceneries. And. Well, an average of 20 typhoons have visited the Philippines in a year. So you just have to imagine like in a year you have to rebuild. In a year you have to, um, to experience 20 or more typhoons. And in a year your house could be destroyed not just once, not just twice, thrice, or maybe um, in the fifth time. Or maybe it won't be um, it won't be rehabilitated anymore because it's so it, it is so destroyed that you cannot fix it anymore. So the Philippines is a prone to tropical cyclones due to its uh, geographical location, um, which generally produce heavy rains and flooding of large areas and also strong winds, which result to heavy casualties to human life and destructions to crops and properties. Thus, it is a, of utmost importance to have sufficient knowledge on such maritime phenomena for beneficial purposes. So um, here is the climate in, impact to, to the Philippines. Who would have, who would have maybe no one from Tacloban. I am now situated in Tacloban. I am here in Tacloban right now. And this is my city seven years ago when Super Typhoon Haiyan struck uh, and we were left by nothing but devastation. This is Tacloban and you cannot imagine how people struggled to find their way home because uh, just going back to their place and seeing their house wasn't there anymore. 
that is how I felt when I ran from our evacuation house to our evacuation center to our house just to find our house empty. There were just three pil pillars that were left in our house and all our belongings, belongings wasn't there anymore. And this is as we were isolated for how many days? There were no help that came. We were just eating what was available in our surrounding, what was available in the ocean. So whatever food is floating there, we were just eating it because we didn't have a choice. And this is the devastation after the Super Typhoon Haiyan. Maybe some of you here have already saw these pictures because um, this has been being posted a lot of times, especially during Yolanda commemoration. And this is one, if you can see there, there are actually six ships who went to the houses, just ravaged all the houses there. And this is one here. There were so many people who died in this in this area, and I have I know someone, um, which I know someone her six family members died during the typhoon, and this is a baby and a mother who struggled to survive on their own. Their family wasn't able to survive. This is Taklawan and thousands of thousands of, of people have died. And when the authorities reached to 6,000 count, counting of deaths, they just stopped counting. And, and we don't believe that there were just 6,000 people who died because there were a total of 30,000 more people who have died if they have just counted all. And even after, even up until today, there are still a lot of bodies that, st that, are, that are still missing. My uncle is still missing. My friend's father and her nephew is still missing. And up until today, we cannot find their bodies. This is the club. This is the part of the club and where the ship came. And this is it now. Let me just, um, we, what, uh, some of my org mates have made this video and I hope to share this with you so that you would see how devastated it was during this for different mm -hmm.
Okay, so that video was um, just so emotional because it says like we were just keep on, we just keep on counting dead bodies. And we sometimes fail to understand that these numbers, these numbers that we are counting, these are people. They are wives, they are husbands. They are children of people. They have been breadwinners. They have been providing for their family. We just keep counting and counting casualties like they're just numbers. We fail to realize that these people who have lost their lives are actually, they, they just have, they have dreams. They have dreams for their family. They have dreams for themselves. But because they needed to die, they needed to they needed to risk their themselves for their maybe other family members. They just cannot reach their dreams anymore. And maybe this kind of a story is just one of many. This is just one of thousands of stories. And there are still more stories out there. And the Philippines is not just the only country that is suffering from the climate disasters. There are still a lot more and there is still stories, thousands, millions of stories around the world that would really tell you how climate change is real. Now, seven years after, the club and is this. After you see how we have been smashed by waves, ships, how the trees have fallen, we, are, we keep on rising. We always, uh, we always wake up in a day like we have to wake up and we really have to reach the dreams because we don't have a choice but to really rise up. And this is Takloban today, trying to survive in our day-to-day -day basis. There are still bodies who are still missing, but we have to go on. And this is one of the ships, they just put it there as a memorial. There were six of them there and then one of this, they didn't just remove. At first they can't remove it from the road. And then when they tried, they just pushed it a little, then they just put it there. And then it, they just decided to just put it as a memorial. And I want to emphasize that it is not resiliency that made us to rise again. No, we didn't have a choice. We, we rose again. We, woke, we wake up every day, not because we're resilient. We, we, we try to cope everything, every climate disaster that we face in our day-to-day -day life, not because we're resilient, but because we don't have a choice but to wake up in a day because we still have a family who love us we still have dreams that we want to achieve in our life. And it's just so unfair that the Philippines, who is just contributing a little to the whole carbon emission, is suffering much from a devastation that we even haven't caused. Right. And then the sun will shine again on us. Just didn't, but yeah. And then two weeks ago, we thought that it would be a good Christmas because last year when I was in Europe doing my talk, there, were, there was a typhoon who ravaged my home and my family, they weren't able to um, celebrate Christmas because our house was washed out on the 24th. And then now two weeks ago, we were ravaged by three strong typhoons. It, it seems to me that it seems to me that they were like trying to, um, I don't know if they were playing, but there are just three of them in a row. And this is not normal. We didn't have like this before. 
And that is the result. A lot of properties have been damaged again. Floods, people who lost their livelihood, their houses, people who were struggling to cope in the middle of a pandemic. People who don't have a home anymore. And if you say like you have to stay home, they just don't have a home. And they are staying in an evacuation center where there are thousands and hundreds of them. And the Philippines is just trying to cope at the moment because we didn't have a choice, but they really survived because we don't have a choice. This is just this week. Up and uh, until today, still happening. This is because of the heavy rain and the floods and it killed people, killed livelihood. This is the aerial view of the place. Twenty fifteen, two years after Super Typhoon Haiyan, Filipino people came to realize that we should not just stay as victims. We should do something that we should really step up. And then we submitted a petition to the Commission on Human Rights in the Philippines to investigate 47 carbon majors in the whole world. There are actually 90 plus of them. However, 47 of them exist. They have branch here in the Philippines. So we have this petition, um, the climate justice petition, and this is Filipino people versus the big polluters. So Filipinos are the front line of climate emergency. The impacts we're experiencing like intense typhoons and drought are expected to get worse. And it is being worse, it is worse now. While the corporations most responsible for climate change are doing business as usual, we need to hold them accountable for fueling climate change and hiding the truth from us for decades. We won't let them profit at the expense of our survival and the future. Because like me, as someone who have survived a super typhoon, a super typhoon I, I felt that these people are just profiting from, from the loss of other people, from the suffering of other people. And we, don't, we should not let that happen. We should stop that. So fossil fuel companies like Shell, ExxonMobil knew decades ago that the burning of fossil fuels could lead to catastrophic climate impacts, which, which would harm people and the planet. But some chose to hide this and undermine the science and the facts. Now the whole world is facing a climate emergency. But a growing number of people around the world are taking legal, taking legal action and others are supporting them by joining the global climate justice movement. So now a lot of uh, like uh, grassroots communities, farmers, fishermen, a lot of us uh, individuals have come together. We have united to make these uh, corporations accountable and legally liable for their actions. The Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines is investigating into the responsibility. Actually, last December 2019, there is already a result of this. And indeed, they can be legally liable, they can be legally accountable for the human rights violations linked to climate impacts. And it has been already announced during the COP25 in Madrid. And, that, and this petition could not just benefit the Filipino people. Around everyone around the world could benefit from this petition because this is the first petition. This is a historic petition, a landmark petition in the world. A lot of uh, countries and organizations could use this uh, legal document to sue these corporations for their human rights violations linked to climate impacts. So we are not just doing this for ourselves, we are also doing this to other vulnerable countries around the world. And now we're just waiting for the um, resolution from the Commission on Human Rights and what could be the next step. The climate change and human rights investigation. So the first ever human rights investigation into corporate responsibility for climate change has served. 
has served as a platform for communities on the front lines of climate impacts to share their stories and for the wor world's leading experts to share the basis for holding the big polluters accountable. Let me just share with you the um, our climate justice story. So I hope I have inspired you and led you to think what could be the other options and what could be the other options. We would really appreciate if you would sign the petition, though we have already, um, there is already uh, a result of the petition, but we want to gather more um, signatures so that the Commission on Human Rights could be really um, pushed to um, release the resolution. Be with us in demanding for climate justice and always know, always think that whatever you do for the environment, you are just, you are not just doing the, that for yourself. You're doing that for a lot of people in the other parts of the world. And a lot of people in the other parts of the world are benefiting from what you're doing. I hope you always choose what is best, not just for yourself, but for the others, because we are all connected and we will all be sharing the same problem if we will not act now, if we will not hold those people, those corporations accountable. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm going to start the discussion round now. So if someone want to ask a question, ask Mary another question, ask a general question about the topic or about uh, typhoon storms on the Philippines and so on, you can just raise your hand or uh, type it in the chat um furthermore you can just turn on your camera and ask the question directly mm. 
But anyway, uh, I would like to begin with a question because I was wondering through the whole presentation, how long does it took to rebuild your village? Because it looks like it was totally destroyed. So um, yeah, how long does it took? Like uh, whenever we have a typhoon, we always want to rehabilitate just after the typhoon because we don't have anywhere to go. However, it's it's not just possible because like a week, a week after or maybe days after, there would be another typhoon who would just come and like destroy everything. I showed you the picture of the downtown. It is the city part of Tacloban. But if you go outside Tacloban, you would see unfinished housing relocations. You would see people who are still striving. You would see people who are still um, living in the same house that they were during Super Typhoon Haiyan because not everyone was relocated. I myself, my family in Eastern Samar is not relocated. We are still we are still living on the mangrove forest, which, which is a shore, which is not safe for storm surges, but we don't have a choice because we don't have anywhere else to go. So I cannot really say that we have recovered. I cannot really say that we have been rehabilitated because we are still on the process of going right now to that phase. But because there is still a lot of challenges that is coming along the way, that is why it's just maybe the problems are just piling up and it's just so um, we still struggle to to say if we are already okay, if we are already recovered. So, um, I mean, for me, as a living, as someone living on the shore, rehabilitation, um, rebuilding our house is not anymore an option. It is the relocation, but we don't have that kind of, we don't have that kind of option because there is no option like that given to us by our government, or we can just relocate ourselves. So, Okay. Thank you. Um, I forgot something um, because first of all, I would like to ask the students to, uh, yeah, give us their question about the presentation. Hi. Hi. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Sorry. Can everybody hear me correctly? <laughs> Yes, okay. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting presentation, Marinel. Um, I have one concrete question towards climate justice. So you talked about a lot, a lot about demanding climate justice. Um, but I'm, I was wondering um, how climate justice, in your opinion, in the Philippines would look like? Is it only like monetary compensation from the big companies? or does it include a concrete action plan? Um, are there any demands you're asking from your local government? So how does climate justice basically, in your opinion, look in the Philippines? Again, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that question. It is a really a good question. For me, when, when, the, when the result of our petition have been announced during the COP25, it was really emotional. I was really emotional. I was like crying a lot because for me, that was first step towards getting the justice that we deserve. For me, having climate justice is seeing that those big corporations not just pay, but really change their business practices. And they should have pay the right tax. They should pay those people who have lost their loved ones, who have lost their livelihoods. And they should really um, pay governments like countries to really have a more sustainable or more uh, typhoon proof evacuation center that could, would cater a lot more people, um, that would like support infrastructure that is not just uh, substandard or that is that can like cope up in big typhoons or big storms and also to relocate people from their from from the shore because that is where their vulner vulnerability lies when i was a child i felt that our place is a very is a paradise is 
Like it is, I am living in a paradise. But when Super Devon Hayan came and just devastated everything, it changed how I look because I felt that our geographic location is the source or the reason why we are vulnerable, why we are suffering that much. And that climate justice for me would be would mean that these big corporations will change their business practices, will always consider how they will affect um, people in the other side of the world. And they will pay for those victims of the climate crisis or the climate related disasters. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, uh, for your lecture. Um, I have the next question. Um, previously in our seminar, we read a text that deals with preparing for climate events such as typhoons. And um, we learned that often the damage caused by a typhoon can be greatly reduced by proper preparement, like improving risk assessment, the building of adaptive capacity and adaptation strategies. So were there further measures taken against typhoons since 2010 and were those measures effective? There are measures um, that our government is doing so that we could mitigate them. We could lessen those effects. However, they're not enough because at some point I could understand why because if they are responding to another typhoon, there comes another typhoon that needs another response. And what is just the thing that I am kind of not, that I am really like, I want to have in our um, preemptive uh, strategies is to have a more proactive actions. Because it seems like disasters have become normal and that our response have become reactive. So we just react if there is already a disaster. Because we have to, as, as much as possible, we have to hold those funds whenever there would be worse that would happen. And in a third world country like the Philippines, I could understand why. Because we don't know how much, or we don't know the whole, the whole devastation would be. So a lot of like some of the government um, government funds have already been reallocated to another um, to another disaster, and then here comes again another disaster, and there is no fund already. So we're just trying to we're just trying to cope up. We're just trying to um, to cope with the losses, and then here comes another that would devastate devastate us again. So there are strategies, but we're still in the same vulnerability as we were before. And that said. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, my name is Ling Yong and I come from Taiwan. So I also have like a lot, of, like my country also have a lot of experience with typhoon and I totally feel you with like the disaster and all this thing, even I personally have experienced that. And also I kind of like know how costly it is with all this measure against Typhoon and all this adaptation is really not kind of like as easy as maybe in academic studies. Um, yeah, and my question is mainly about like, so yeah, like I, I found the legal actions you, um, you're presenting is really, really interesting. So I wonder, are you also like taking other actions um, for, for the climate justice in Philippines? So yeah, like other action outside legal actions. And also the others, I wonder during like the, like to, like to undergo this, the whole legal process, what kind of like difficulties or what experience have you made? And yeah, like is, was that easy or there are like some really, really difficult part and like, yeah, like how is it the stake goes now also. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. So, yeah, a lot, actually there, we are doing a lot of things outside that climate justice petition that we have made. Like here in the Philippines last 2018, we had this brand audit 
and we don't really believe that coastal cleanup or community cleanup helps because there are just band aid solutions for us. So what we did with the things that we have collected during the community and coastal clean cleanup, we segregated them, we audited them depending on the brands, and then we made a data on who are those most polluters in Tacloban. And then we aimed that all of those trashes that we have collected from those five big um, polluters in the club and we would just bring it back to them so they have to be responsible with their trash. And then we have submitted an ordinance along with that to our city councilor to ban the single-use plastics in the club. And because we have, um, we saw that there are still wrappers who were just, who were like reduced maybe even before me, my parents were not even married at that time, maybe. And they're still there. They're just 1980s rappers. And we have collected them during our, um, during our community and coastal cleanup. And we want the city of Tacloban to uh, declare climate emergency. So our climate strikes are actually kind of different to other climate strikes because we always want to make uh, like a concrete or like um, a clear, a clear, a clear call of action to our government because we felt like here in the Philippines, rallying and protesting is like a stigma. It's stigmatized. A lot of people are saying like that is a rebellious act and that is not okay and that is not good so what we did is we always send petition like we want our leaders to know what we want from them so that they would know how to respond to our action so one of that is in 2008 uh, 2019 in may um during my graduation we submitted a petition again to the city council for them to declare climate emergency. We want them to know that the youth are watching them. We want them to know that the youth want to be involved in decision-making processes, especially if it involves us, if it involves our future. That is why um, actually last week we were called from our, uh, we were called from the council, from the legislation office here in Tacloban because they wanted to have a consultation with the petition that we have submitted to them. So we could see now that they're actually doing something on the things that we have submitted to them because we always send them like follow-up letters like we, are, we, we know that you are not doing something to this request, kindly do something and all like that. And we want like here in the Philippines, we always want to have like partnership with the, with the government because the, like we as 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 we want it or not, um, the the government is the authority. They have the authority. They have the resources to make change to make things happen, and we want them to partner with them in making those change changes. Yeah, and that is not like. Even Super Tiffin High and I have been already going to remote communities to talk about the basics of climate change, how to mitigate it, um, what we could do as a community to help adapt and mitigate its effects. And we did radio broadcasting, we do theater recitals and all sorts of uh, dissemination about climate change because if you go to rural communities if you go to remote communities you would be surprised that a lot of people actually don't know what is climate change or they don't even maybe know um, what's causing the sea level rise though they have this intimate relationship with the environment they don't know what's causing the change in the environment and that is a very that is a very for me alarming because we can't solve something that we don't know a problem. I mean, we can solve a problem that we don't know. I mean, the, there should be like an acceptance from us that it is a problem so that we can solve them. And for me, education is the key. We have to educate people. Sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> Bye now. 
thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, it was very moving and powerful, I thought. Um, so it's great to, to have you here. Um, maybe could you just explain just quickly how climate, the, the typhoons are connected to climate change? Why, why is that connected? Yeah, during, um, during our film in 2015, it has been explained by some scientists that, that Typhoon Haiyan is not yet an effect of climate change. Because um, if we say that it is an effect of climate change, it has to be observed in a minimum of 30 years. So, however, Super Typhoon Haiyan has been exacerbated by climate change because of the ocean warming. When the, when the ocean warms, it strengthens the intensity of the typhoon. So typhoons are actually being developed in the ocean, being us situated in the Western Pacific Ocean, we are prone to so many typhoons. We can be passed by so many typhoons. And these typhoons are actually developed in the ocean. So when the ocean, were, when the ocean is warm, it, uh, like develops it strengthens the typhoon and that that is what happened that was what happened to super typhoon Haiyan because while super typhoon Haiyan was developing the ocean was warm and before it made landfall to the land it was already a super typhoon and and that was the first super typhoon that we had and after that we had a lot more a lot more of super typhoons and that is not just a coincidence i mean I don't want to accept that it could be our way of life in the next 10 to 10 years, or maybe now it's already starting. But if we will not do something, then maybe we will have maybe a category six typhoons because before the strongest was category three and we have now category five. And maybe it could be strengthened more if we will not do something now. Did I answer your question, Oliver? Yeah, yeah, that's I thought yes. it's good that people make the connection again. Okay. Um, Marina and hi. Um, my name is Jutta, and uh, first let me express uh, my deep uh, sorry for your loss and for your situation. Um, what I would like to ask, uh, maybe it's a bit um, Another another topic, but uh, you mentioned during your uh, lecture that um, that this is happening and you have a pandemic. Um, do you think that the pandemic makes it even worse? I mean, for the people, um, one, on, on one side they have the typhoon, yeah, and they have to survive. They struggle very hard. That was became clear. And on the other on the other side, um, yeah, you would have to keep social distancing, which is impossible. Yeah, and you have these refugees refugee camps. So um, I, I guess also this will have a deep impact. So how's, how's the current situation with the pandemic for the moment and the typhoon, of course? As of the moment, people are just really trying to survive. Yeah. And trying to um, follow safety protocols. But the reality is there is no social distancing and evacuation centers mm -hmm. when they are just set, when they are just sleeping in a covered port in a gym in a gymnasium mm -hmm. when they are just uh, sleeping in a bag or just a cartoon or whatever and everyone is just trying to survive and everyone here like my friends and all of us are just trying to help giving donations food, water, um, clothes, we have been sending a lot. Even what I, I will have from this um, conversation, from this lecture, I will also send it all to the donation drives. Yeah. Because we just, I mean, people just need help. Like a lot of people have already been suffering since the pandemic started. A lot of people have lost their their jobs and they have been struggling to find food. How much more that they don't have any more a house now yeah. how much more if they don't have any possessions now how much more if they don't have anything now they don't have a book uh, their children might not go to school anymore because everyone is everything is online everything is on module everything you, you have to you have to pay for for data to have um to have a virtual class and 
those kind of things. And a lot of people are actually, can't, a lot of people can't, not, can't afford that kind of education. And even with the pandemic, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of children who already said that they can, but they would not be enrolling and they have not enrolled. How much more now that there, there was um, typhoons? I, I guess long. Mm, I guess that, that uh, the government will try to help whatever it can, uh, it can. Um, but um, I mean, I, as what I understood from, from your lecture is that um, the civic, civil society it's a very big demand to the civil society to do more. I mean, of course, you have relocation and all this, and the government can do what it, what it can do. But what, what does the civil society can do on its own? I mean, when you hear, I, I don't know, have you information that you know, uh, well, the, another typhoon is approaching and that you know uh, how we have to close our homes, we have to relocate, we have to, to leave or whatever. Is there any... any um, yeah, what the civil society does, because I mean, I, I don't know if, if any typhoon is going to surprise you, you know? Um, civil societies are actually like leading the response now here mm. in the Philippines. Just so surprising how they have been trying to fill in the gap of the government. And they have been there every typhoon. Sorry, can you hear me right? It's difficult, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they have been really doing a lot. Like now, what I'm seeing is a lot of individuals, private individuals, civil societies have been gathering to have these donations go to mm. the to those who need it. Like sometimes there is a great division now in the Philippines on the liberal liberals and the Democrats. Like I mean from people because our president now, as you may know, mm -hmm. um, is not really doing its part, but maybe he's doing it, but we, people don't see it. A lot of people have been trying to um, see if where he was during those crazy times. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would like to, to um, encourage the others to, to, to say something as well, but I, I, let me please uh, ask you a last question because now that you, that you uh, mentioned the government. Um, I don't know if you have ever heard about um, this Dutch case. Um, I don't know if I, uh, if I pronounce it correctly. It is Urgenza. This is a Dutch NGO who sued um, its own government. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have heard about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but I guess that will be and no they option. won. Yeah, they won, I know. I guess that will be no option for you. Uh, because you explained that you would like to um, work together with the government, yeah. Yeah, and they and the, we have this campaign to make uh, like the government accountable. But we we need them to, to be accountable because people they should have been there leading for the response to the people who needed the most. But it seems to us like the government is not doing enough. And that is why the private people and the civil societies have to organize themselves just to just to help people because the government is not doing enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for all your responses. I wish you good luck with your, um, um, what is it? Uh, your petition. <laughs> and I will find it, of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, yes, more? I have one. <laughs> Sorry, Maxi. Yeah. Uh, Marine, thank you at first. Can you say us um, how and where I or we can make donations to be sure that it's uh, arrived the uh, right persons and not something somewhere? <laughs> Can you write it in the I, chat or do you have any ideas to find something like that? Yeah, I, my friends and I are actually doing some donation drives and just the, the other day we already sent a lot of clothes and food to Cagayan de Oro. I mean Cagayan de Oro. To Cagayan, those people who, who were victims. And 
I will maybe try to um, coordinate with Oliver on that if you want to donate. Yeah, that will be great. Thank you. And of yeah. course, I sign your petition. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so is there anyone else who want to ask something? You can write, yeah, Oliver. Yeah, just to get back to the, the liability strategy, um, which I find very um, powerful, to be honest, because if you think about it, uh, these if the big polluters are, are liable, which I mean, in fact, they are, then they should pay for the damage, but also the the um, the loss of of people's loved ones. So it would very quickly become very expensive for them, and we're talking about billions and billions of, of dollars, right? Um, and this money is needed for by the communities affected by climate change. So I think it's a very very good demand. Um, but how can we? Is it? Is it a demand that's being taken up also, for example, by Fridays for Future in Europe? Because of course, here the these big polluters usually have their headquarters in in the global north. So I think this should be one of the key demands of the climate justice movement, um, also in the global north. So what what do people from Fridays for Future say about this? And is this something that we should be discussing more? I'm not sure is this a question to Fridays for Future or should Marinelle answer it? Yeah, I think you, you, you can answer it as well if you get an answer. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not 100% sure if um, we actually have this as a demand in our demands to our government in the moment. But Fridays for Future is working together with, um, like, on global scale because we have a lot of Fridays for Future movements around the globe, and um, exchanging. And um, of course, I think we will happy to be happy. Oh, we will be happy to promote this. But this was also um, what I would like to ask Marinelle because I remember when we first met, you talked we talked about the climate conferences and you said that often you were invited to speak um, but you had like the feeling that they only felt like they wanted to hear a sad story but they were not um, like eager to change anything and that sentence really stuck in my head and um, so my question for you would be um, because that's something we discuss also with Fridays for Future a lot or Students for Future a lot, like how can we be better allies and how can we be really like a climate justice movement. So what do you think should Fridays for Future groups, climate justice movements in the global north should do more to make voices like yours heard and um, really demand the change? I think you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, Sorry I was sorry. sorry. Um, I, th I think, as I was saying, I think um, you in the global north, have, you can do so much because you have a choice and you have, you know, those, you have the, I mean, sorry to, for the, but like you have the privileges and then you can make, uh, you can really have a great change. And it would be really awesome for it. I just, feel really grateful and I really appreciate it that Oliver brought um, about uh, um, supporting that petition because it would really mean a lot to us if you would do it. Also, if you will demand um, accountability from this or the, from this big corporation, especially because big, their big branches are in the global north uh, would really mean, I mean, it's really a nice way of supporting people like us. And yes, I have said that and I still feel the same. Like I am, I am invited to a lot of big conferences just because people, you know, world leaders just want to have a sad story. 
And then I don't know if they even take it seriously or if they do something about it. That is why maybe I have also told you, Lara, in Germany, I was at that time, I was really determined that I would really educate myself. I would really find a scholarship that would support me so that I could be an expert in this. I will not just be a victim telling a sad story to people that I am just, you know, and I want to be in the area where the decision is being made. That is why I really want to um, find a scholarship and educate myself on, on this topic. And I want really to have a master's degree. And then I feel like if I already do that, I, could, I would have more credibility to talk not just my experience, of course, my story and the story of many people who have suffered the brunt of climate change is very important. It humanizes science. It humanizes how climate change would affect us in the future. It is a very important for future action. But also we want to make sure that these people who are listening to our stories would do something. And I want to make sure of that. That is why I really, that is one of my goals to really study more and to have masters. And I don't want to have masters here in the Philippines, but because they don't offer that kind of, sorry, I just said that, but like, like yeah. And yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, our master is in, in German. Uh, <laughs> but uh, once you've got your master's, if you want to do your PhD with us, yeah, just let us know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, thank you. Um, if there ain't uh, any more questions, are there? Mm, no? Seems like there ain't any more questions. Uh, so yeah, I would like to thank you again. Marinelle for your great presentation um, and yeah thanks for uh, having us thanks for joining us our yeah our climate controversy talk um, I don't know me and you turn on your camera do you want to say something at the end no okay um, yeah so thanks for coming thanks for joining uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and yeah do you want to say something at the end uh, Marinelle Thank you so much for listening to my story and the story of my community. And I hope that we will, again, we will see each other soon in our climate actions. And I really hope that you will, um, you will not be tired of doing something, of doing more for our environment. Just always think that whenever you do something good for the environment, you're doing it for us. You're doing it for people are already bearing the brand of climate change. And we here in the Philippines too are doing our best to cope and to survive and to make our government and those corporations accountable. And may we always not um, be tired and not um, doubt ourselves. We will really make a difference. Thank you. And uh, don't forget that the link is still in the chat, so you can sign the petition. Uh, it's pretty e easy. Just click the link. Um, and yeah. And Go also ahead. the next, the talk next week, Maxi. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, I forgot that. Uh, yeah. Uh, now I would like to invite Diana for, <clears throat> uh, yeah, to introduce the next speaker for next week. Yep. Ah, uh, thank you, Oliver. You saved me. <laughs> Uh, hi, so we have next week um, a lecture from Loretta Burke. She is a senior senior of the Institute World, World Resources Institute of the US. And she's helping cities and coastal areas prepare for future and the climate, in, and the climate change. Uh, the topic from the lecture will be calcium carbonate calamity threats to the coral triangle and Loretta will tell us how important the coral triangle is for all of us. So I hope we see us again and I've, I'm sure this will be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Diana. <laughs> and yeah, see you guys again next week. Um, yeah, and I wish you uh, 
good evening, especially you, Marinelle. Sleep tight. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Marinelle. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.